Well, hello, welcome to I Love Gay Today. And today we are diving into the world of art in Miami, and we are here with Pioneer Winter. How are you? Hey, Matt. It's great to be here. Thank That's you so for good having to be... me. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad I was through, uh, through a previous uh, interview we had done, and one of your uh, friends and colleagues, uh, I'm so glad she connected us because, yeah, ever since, you know, I'm kind of going through a lot of what you do, and it's it's amazing. Um, and, it's, and it's so unique in that sense. I, I think some of these, some of what you do, I don't think I've ever seen before. So, uh, so uh I love what you're developing. And so it's called you have something, it's called the Pioneer Winter Collective. And uh it's theater, contemporary dance. But yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh Pioneer Winter Collective. Um it's a, a dance company uh that uh is intergenerational and physically integrated, meaning that uh it uh normal uh normal constraints that I think uh, one would assume there are in dance, like don't exist in my company. Um, we look for dance outside the mainstream, look for beauty outside the mainstream, um, and are constantly seeking to expand the definition of all that dance is and can be. Um, and, and one of the biggest ways we do that is by the people that you see on stage. Um, typically dance has been very exclusive, um, uh, both with uh, the cost for consumer and, you know, being a patron of the arts is usually seen as like some sort of major philanthropic position. Uh, and then as well as like the, the cost of the artist and what they're put through um, and how oftentimes they really can't truly be themselves on stage. So uh, in both ways, um, we're, we're trying to create a more accessible dance world. Yeah. Well, that comes through. And one of the quotes that I saw from you, I loved finding dance in all bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like saying finding dance, you know, rather than creating, because like it, it's there, you know, it's just like uh, when you, um, uh, when you go excavating, you know, ex an excavation isn't just some blind searching. It's, it's an assumption or a knowing that something is there and it's waiting for you to find it. So uh, yeah, I, I, I do like to think about the art that we make that way. You have a variety of different projects, and uh, but one of them that I saw, um, Bird of Paradise, that you you um, that's been around for you've had it for a few years, and it's still ongoing. But but I really um, there was an interview of you, and it was interesting when you had said uh, it it really taps into that queer folk are underrepresented even even within the queer community, and it seems like you're yes. you know you're really kind of reaching out to to bring a much more diverse group um, out there on stage as well. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think. Um... Uh, we've come a long way, the LGBTQ community, but I believe that even within the queer community, um, uh, uh, many of us have it better than others, yeah. you know, like, uh, like whether it's, it's, uh, it's, um, masculinity or it's whiteness or it's the, the type what, you know, it's the type of body you're born into. Um, uh, uh there, there's also a lot of ageism. Um, yeah. you know, and, uh, so birds of paradise is looking at transformation and rebirth because, you know, let's say queer people know a lot about rebirth. Yeah. A lot of us have gone through multiple births. You know, I would say like coming out is a type of rebirth, yeah. um, you know, and, uh, looking at those rebirths and appreciating them. And, uh, because we, started Birds of Paradise right before the pandemic happened. Um, it really became a lot about individual um, rebirths or transformations that are happening without anybody else being around. So there's like an intimacy, there's a vulnerability. Um, and uh, we created the first set of films that are used in Birds of Paradise as a response to the pandemic and me only really being able to work one on one with performers uh, since it wasn't safe to meet in groups yet. Yeah. Uh, so what started off as a group piece became a series of solos. And then once the pandemic, once things improved and we were able to get back together, then it sort of reformed the ensemble. And so there are, are three iterations of the work now. The first one we premiered in September of 2021 at the Arsh Center in uh, Miami, and they were also the ones that commissioned the first iteration. And that was large scale film. Uh, we had eight short films plus uh, two, uh, uh, three, three segments of live performance that was integrated with film. And then we um, 
uh, had a number of projects in between. And then I went back to Birds of Paradise again, May of 2022. We performed at Miami-Dade County Auditorium. And this time um, we only had one projection surface, but I used the house of the theater and I put the audience on the stage looking out towards the house and hanging from the catwalk that stretches across uh, the, the house of the theater, um, we had uh, silks hanging. And then, so that was the projection surface. And then the performers were on the apron part of the stage. So um, uh, so the uh, there was this enormous depth that was created and that was really exciting. And now for the current version that we premiered at the San Gabriel Rivers Theater last month and what we're gonna be taking on tour uses four projection surfaces in a circle around the performance space. So uh, the audience doesn't have to choose between, am I looking at the film or am I looking at the live performance? I can almost just look straight ahead and see both in the yeah. same frame. And so that, that's that been the goal of, is creating greater integration. Um, and the piece has changed a lot. Like it, we've uh, looked at imagery of like murmurations and flocking and, you know, um, at how much does one flock? How much does one become part of a collective or part of a group before you lose your sense of identity? And, you know, and what does that mean to be able to find yourself again, but then also still like, and, and kind of have that agency. Um, uh, so, so uh, rebirth and the solitude and the isolation and this kind of void that the pandemic created um, has led us to a, a much brighter future in the work uh, where we're looking more at joy and the appreciation of how far one has come um, in an ensemble setting while still um, being very unique. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really happy with how the the, the piece uh, has developed and we created the study guide for it too, just because it's had so many twists and turns that um, it's it's been really well documented uh, yeah. uh, as far as like um, all the, all the things that's been in its evolution. No, that's excellent. And also even locally, you're, you're, you're really kind of doing a lot as well, but you're a curator and festival director for Screen Dance Miami. Yeah, Screen Dance Miami is uh, actually, we're gonna be celebrating our, tam our 10th year okay. uh, in January. Uh, so Screen Dance Miami um, started off as a program of Tiger Tail Productions and Mary Luft, um, uh, which is uh, now unfortunately, uh, uh, no longer uh, still presenting, um, but uh, Tiger Tail started Screen Dance Miami in like 2014, I think. Okay. And um, yes, uh, January 2014. And then um, it was directed by Marissa Nick, uh, who you had as a guest um, yeah. uh, for um, three years. And then I took it over and I've been the director for the last seven. Um, so uh, yeah, and um, uh the Miami Light Project is now the the producer of Screen Dance Miami and Beth Boone, and they've kept me on as director. And um, yeah, it's um, I love how much the festival has changed. Uh, and I think there's uh, there was definitely a surge in film and artists interested in creating film because yeah. of the pandemic. So um, yeah. yeah and, and I was gonna say, and lastly, I will say that I was as I was especially on your Facebook feed, you had some amazing pictures and things from something you're doing with a uh, with a group of kids and it's the orchid adventure and and uh it seems like you're kind of blending you know this this orchid show i concept it with uh with dance and art and it again very unique oh thank you um so that uh the uh, closer encounters project is sort of the umbrella project and um we uh i, I collaborate on this with uh yurai Koij who's a composer and sound designer, uh, professor at University of Miami. Yeah. He also did all the sound for Birds of Paradise. So I work really closely with him. And so this is sort of like a, a separate project that um, we've been collaborating on. And this also has had many different iterations. We uh, did the first version at the Electric Tree, um, uh, which is uh, in Griffin Park. Uh, and the Electric Tree uh, has these green and yellow lights it's an installation through the Museum of Contemporary Art, North Miami. And so we activated the tree um, using um, uh, dance as well as storytelling. And we had these sensors that were worn on our wrist that um, based upon, uh, they're, they're 
uh, acceler accelerometers and gyroscopes. And so they um, respond to how you, you know, the, the orientation and sort of like based upon like this, like the linearity of, of the way, um, the way someone can kind of conduct the sound. And uh, we, we did it that way. And then um, we did a performance with um, uh, Miami Children's Chorus at the band shell. And for that, we didn't use the sensors, but we had the this really beautiful uh, fabric and these huge industrial fans that were already at the band shell and uh, blasted those. And so like it created really ghostly, beautiful floral shapes. Um, and then this most recent version we did in Coconut Grove, and that was mm -hmm. with um, uh, Yurai uh, brought in uh, the Miami Sound Choir, yeah. um, and they were, you know, that, that's a group of adults. So, and and I have to say that this version was much more playful even than like what we did with Miami Children's Course. So <laughs> it was definitely like adults being kids, and there was like a cheerful, a cheerful chaos to it all. Um, and and much different than Birds of Paradise and 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 ways that I work with like maybe projects that um, I'm leading by myself, you know, uh, versus things that um, I'm collaborating with someone on that's almost outside of like the scope of what I normally do. It really gives me an opportunity to 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 be playful, you know. That's fantastic. Well, I noticed that you uh, you you perform like you had Bird of Paradise or others uh, here in New York, so uh, that's. Uh, uh, my area and I would love to uh, you'll have to let me know because uh, uh, I would love to see you in, in the real world oh yes uh, we well we pr um, had our New York debut during uh, APAP the yeah. association of uh, what's it, arts and professionals of something about they have like this big uh, conference every year in January and um, uh, uh, through Rhizome Arts Consulting who were represented by we were able to um uh, perform uh, at New York City Center for potential presenters, as well as the ALE Black Box Studio um, uh, or ALE Theater. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to come back to New York. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be great to uh, perform up there and do the full version because when we were there in January, we only did like the first uh, uh, 20 minutes of it and it's about an hour long piece. So. Well, fantastic. Well, I'm really just glad that you were able to take a few moments of your time and kind of share a bit of your story here with our audience as well. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, look forward to being able to, to see all this up live and uh, we'll stay in touch here over the over the months. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Thanks again. Take care. <sighs>